all around Georgetown for the past few months, there has been much evidence of broken roads, piles of slate and rubble, and massive craters filled with water. We could tell you that due to current celestial alignment of the planet and the position of the sun, small meteors have been hitting Georgetown. But as much as this looks possible, judging from the state of most roads, it's sadly not the case. It's actually evidence of a massive IDB-funded campaign to improve the sewage system. In this episode, Real Ghana takes a closer look at the implementation of the Georgetown Sanitation Improvement Project with a view to determining just how effectively $2 billion is being spent and hopefully start to make the case for a public procurement commission, among other things. In addition to the sewage problem, we can also take a look at the garbage piling up in the city and the predictable yet unmitigated flooding which has brought and is bringing misery to so many. More importantly, in this episode, we also start to look at ways to fix a few of Guyana's chronic problems with a few candid interviews thrown in for good measure. Welcome to Guyana, Sewage and the City. The Georgetown Water Supply and Sewer System Program was a project costing 30 million US dollars, approved in 1999, that aimed to improve sanitary conditions in Georgetown and reduce current levels of environmental degradation by improving the quality of water supply and sewage services. The project closed in 2010 after only achieving some of its objectives. As of 2012, the IDB has aided in the preparation of two new water and sanitation projects in Guyana. The Georgetown Sanitation Improvement Project worth 10 million US dollars and a 12 million dollar project to rehabilitate the water system of Guyana's second largest town, Linden. The central Georgetown sewage system provides service to approximately 50,000 residents in the service area, at least according to a Wikipedia entry. This area is bound by the Demerara River in the west, Vlissingen Road in the east, the Atlantic Ocean in the north, and Sussex Street in the south. The system was first commissioned in 1929 and was designed to serve a population of 10,000 residents. That's 84 years ago. An Italian consultancy firm, Hydea, were tasked with producing the environmental and social impact assessment for the sewage improvement project. We had a good read and looked at all related documentation and media we could find from GWI itself on the matter, including this video. That uncomfortable gentleman in the red shirt is actually the project manager. By the government of Guyana through the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB. But could you tell us how did the entire thing come about? Okay, thank you very much, Timothy. And a special good night to our viewers. Uh, the Jarshong Sanitation Improvement Program is an initiative by the government of Guyana and funded by the the IDB for at the tune of US ten million dollars. Now there are several components that comprise the entire program but of specific interest is the the priority works which we consider as the, the main works under the Georgetown Sanitation Improvement Program. Now the scope of the work entails the complete rehabilitation of the entire sewer system. Now, the sewer system, as we know it today, is over 70 years old. There are pipelines that are, have been there in existence over 75 to 80 years old, and there are 24 sewer stations that is connected to the, to the system that receives the sewer that is being pumped into the Atlantic. And so, given the deplorable stage or the deplorable state of the system today, it was a wise initiative, a very wise investment on behalf of the government of Guyana to address the issue of the poor level of service that the business community and the residents in general are being experienced, uh, have, have been experienced over the last couple of years. And so this program is geared to completely rehabilitate and overall the entire system. Great. A lot, a lot, that sounds like a, a huge project and I know yes. you're tasked with all of that, um, Orin. Yes. Um, and we should mention, you mentioned that the, um, the sewer mains themselves will be rehabilitated. Yes, the sewer mains will be rehabilitated. As a matter of fact, we will be replacing over 12 kilometers of pipelines that are in existence, that are old, that are full of encrustation, and that are, that are leaky, and that is creating pop-ups around the, around the city where leakage and other 
adverse um, occurrences is prevalent. And so we try to eliminate all of that under this program. The direct beneficiaries of the project are the users of the Central Georgetown sewage system, which is now five times the number of people it was intended to cater for, while the total beneficiaries are all the inhabitants of Greater Georgetown, around 239,000 people based on results from the 2002 Guyana census. We're still awaiting the 2012 census, but that should give you an idea of just how much strain the sewage system is under. Yes, how long it been like this? Oh, the last couple of years, yeah. And then, so it's, they don't come and clear it or anything? Not take care of that nobody ever comes. Some of the main problems encountered through the condition assessment analysis of the current sewage system concluded, in addition to other things, that there was infiltration of wastewater from street sewers and manholes, leakage from the ring main, trench crossings and delivery mains, insufficient use of pumps due to malfunctioning, or constraints linked to energy consumption. Additionally, it was discovered that there was inadequate pressure at the outfall diffuser, and the amount of time wastewater is being retained in sewers, manholes and raising mains was too long. That said, you already know this if you live in the capital. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what the situation is be like? It's a real mess of situation, man, you know, especially with these, um, with these, poli poli with these politicians inside me. At least, you know, that man make we pay fat and them things, though, know, and still be paying fat. The people are making money from fat and still ain't spending no money in Lulu. Do nothing, you understand? This place here could drain and they're dry. But due to the drainage, nobody ain't coming and cleaning and no mating it or nothing, so... It's, so it's, I see you got some wood down here. How long? There's yeah, like a permanent fixture well, just in case it rain. Yeah, right. This is a temporary um, setup we do here. So right now we scrape it money now to see if we could raise it right now because it hamburger me from doing we work and so you know that we do we got a little business at the back here we just do some some welding and fabrication. Mm -hmm. So you know say when we it it's affect business. Out, you know, yes, it so it all in there flood show me now. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're trying to sand, I sand till a piece and trying to make it out. We're trying to raise the level a yeah. bit, but it's a personal expense you have to go into to do yeah, this. Yeah, right, exactly. When yeah, they could have just cleared the drains. Yeah, right, if the drains are maintaining and clearing, we would have got this problem here, eh? you know. Because this is lately casting what people do in one. And you cast this lately? Yes, you understand, yes. And still, like, it don't work well. It's like, you don't know what you have to do. This here snakes and sand to pee and um, plenty of not a nice situation. They did clean the drain and got this thing made. We wouldn't get this problem. Here. We wouldn't get this problem. Yeah, yeah, understand. We pay fat and all them things about it and none of them. People tell me we pay fat things and the better off. We can get things and send food and everything. And them nothing and how many body fat and doing nothing to nobody. Right now they're like vampire. They just take away money. How can we fat it up? Like a bully. Plans for the upgrade are extensive and include the complete reconstruction of the ring main for a total length of 5.5 kilometers in addition to the replacement of the delivery mains from pumping stations to the ring. We'll post more links with details in the description but what's important here is value for money. The last loan for 30 million US dollars approved by the IDB in 1999 was slashed to 16 million as part of our debt cancellation package and that particular project didn't get rave reviews. So here we find ourselves again with another loan and another big project. Like many projects in recent years, the Ministry of Public Works have sat this one out and contracted private entities to conduct public works. S. Jagabin and Nabi Construction have won the contract and are undertaking work in partnership with each other. The Haidi report is pretty long, and we don't expect many to have read it through, though if you use a toilet in Georgetown, you should. There are a few things worth sharing right here, right now, because if you travel around the country with some of these things going around your head, we hope you'll start to judge your environment more honestly. We encourage it. We're hoping each of you can start to take an honest look up and down and around the country 
and start making a more informed assessment of what you're seeing. Haidea notes that the project cost is estimated at 1.68 billion Guyanese dollars and additionally, a lump sum has been provided for emergency rehabilitation of street sewers in selected locations to cater for the fact degradation of street and yard sewers is also responsible for a considerable amount of infiltration of wastewater in the ground. At the launching of the project, the minister indicated that the project will cost 2 billion Guyanese dollars. We have our chief executive of GWI who has been very vibrant for the, for the past few weeks. He is very enthusiastic. He has a strategic vision for GWI. And at this time, I'd like to for, us, for you to join with me in putting our hands together and welcoming Mr. Sheikh Bach. Thank you very much. Now, this is a stakeholder's consultation because this is a major project. Over $2 billion will be spent on the Georgetown Sanitation Improvement Program. What Real Guyana has noticed, however, is that on all the signboards put up by the government to highlight their good work, the price quoted is $1.2 billion. We hope this is an honest clerical error and not meant to mislead the public with regards to how much money needs to be accounted for. Next, they made note of the importance of the environmental and social issues in Guyana as expressed by our constitution, local legislation, and international acts to which we are signatories. It's worth internalizing this next piece of information because it truly drives home the fact that we live in a lawless land where our very constitution is being disregarded. We'll juxtapose a few lines from our constitution against a few clips of everyday life in Guyana to help you see what we mean. These are taken from the Guyana Act No. 2 of 1980 and its consecutive amendments in 2003. Article 25 Every citizen has a duty to participate in activities to improve the environment and protect the health of the nation. Article 36. The well-being of the nation depends upon preserving clean air, fertile soils, pure water, and the rich diversity of plants and animals. Article 149J. The environment. Everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to his or her health or well-being. The state shall protect the environment for the benefit of present and future generations through reasonable legislative and other measures designed to a. prevent pollution and ecological degradation, b. promote conservation, and c. secure sustainable development and use of natural resources while promoting justifiable economic and social development. Our National Environmental Action Plan, developed in 1994 and updated in 2000, further states as its main goals the preservation or control of pollution in order to maintain the integrity of the land and natural purity of the air and water resources, the general preservation and conservation of ecological integrity, and the protection of natural habitats and fragile ecosystems in particular. Policies from the Millennium Development Goals, the Environmental Protection Act and Hazardous Waste Management Regulations Act of 2000 were some which also played a role in forming the content of the Environmental Impact Assessment. Here are some of the things turned up in the document which concerned us greatly. No standards are available for domestic sewer effluents and no monitoring arrangements for water effluent are presently in place. Now this is important in our opinion because the problem of sewage leaking into our filthy drains is compounded by the fact those drains are rarely ever cleaned and much of the city is prone to flooding after it rains. Every time a president change, the water still there. That for sure, and they're spending five years on the seat and the water still there, all the time. Nothing doing. Nothing doing at all. It further means there are no systems in place to educate and inform the public just how many harmful bacteria are in the water so they can take proper precautions. With the purpose of evaluating the actual quality of effluent in present conditions, the consultants hired conducted an extensive research in Georgetown 
to identify laboratories specializing in water quality testing. Different labs of public and private organizations have been consulted, including GWI, University of Guyana, and the Guyana Sugar Corporation. But it was not possible to perform a complete set of water quality analyses from the same sample, including measurement of total and fecal coliforms, among other. Fecal coliforms are bacteria, and they're the most common microbiological contaminants of natural waters. Fecal coliforms live in the digestive tracts of warm-blooded animals, including humans, and are excreted in the feces. Although most of these bacteria are not harmful and part of the normal digestive system, some are pathogenic to humans. Those that are pathogenic can cause disease such as gastroenteritis, ear infections, typhoid, dysentery, hepatitis A, and cholera. A fecal coliform test is used to determine whether water has been contaminated with fecal matter. The presence of fecal coliform indicates the possible presence of organisms that can cause illness. The test can be performed relatively quickly and easily. The EPA should have set acceptable limits for fecal coliform in the water based upon use of the water. For example, drinking water cannot contain any fecal coliform, but water for swimming may contain up to 400 fecal coliform colonies per 100 milliliters. Now take North Road for example. This is one of the most contaminated drains in the city. Using your nose and your eyes alone, you know there's feces in the water. Early in the morning, we've seen homeless people and junkies up and down this stretch emptying their bowels into the drains or in the grass where it gets washed into the drains by the rains. There's a man just pulled his penis out and he's just letting it out in public. Right across from the church, there goes the shake back in the pants. As we said, there's no testing. So as disturbing as it is to see kids fishing in the same water further up the road in the afternoons, their ignorance is largely due to a lack of proper information. Most of the drains in the city should be off limits for fishing until it is established just how polluted these waters are. Think it doesn't affect you? Invariably, some of the hassa and tilapia caught in these drains ends up in the fish market. And who are you and I to know any better? It is our right to be informed and to be protected, our constitutional right. The consultants further recommended that the GWI or EPA acquire the necessary equipment for the execution of in-house analysis for the continued monitoring of wastewater quality. And we couldn't agree more. According to the idea document, Sewer waste is currently discharged via a short outfall at the east bank of Demerara River estuary into the Atlantic Ocean at Fort Groin in Kingston. According to the as-built drawings, the outfall pipe is laid offshore on a length of about 40 meters and the diffuser, the hose squirting the dirty water into the river, is at a depth of 7.6 meters below the highest tide elevation. That's about 6 meters below mean sea level. They further state that the outfall is located at the river mouth, north of the zone occupied by the docks and harbour infrastructures, away from residential houses and recreational activities, with only the presence of some utility structures in the direct vicinity. Only some of that is true, but here's what's not. The outfall pipe which is meant to pump all the untreated sewage from the city is located here on a map of Georgetown. This is what it's meant to look like. At high tide, the water level is supposed to be higher than the level of the outfall, thus allowing the waste to discharge into the subsurface current. The reason it's about 40 meters offshore is to minimize the risk of the sewage washing back up onto the beach or polluting the air with a gut-wrenching stench and bacteria, as is currently the case. This was a part of the earlier 16 million US dollar IDB loan for sanitation improvement, and it's already broken. There seems to have been either a miscalculation with regard to the buoyancy of the outfall pipe and the amount of weight required to hold it down, or the contracting in question failed to take the necessary steps to secure the concrete weights which would have prevented this. But at least this time it's not the harbour bridge or a newly built wharf that's floated away. The good news is that it's still attached, which begs the question, how come nobody's shown up to fix it? 
According to one of the guards on the site, the pipe hasn't been working for close to a year because of this kink and the fact the now scattered weights were never put back in place and properly secured. It's like crapping on your money, then literally pouring it down the drain. So how has Georgetown really been getting rid of its sewage? Well, for over a year, sewage trucks have been simply coming right back to this spot and dumping it into the water. Neither is there any sign to alert the public of this practice, nor is there any care taken to even attach a hose to the back of the truck so the waste discharges directly into the water. In some cases, little attention is paid to the state of the tide and the sewage-laden water hangs around for hours with a stench I cannot describe in words. Here's a stain on the outfall pipe for your viewing pleasure. The security guards and workers manning the cokers in the immediate vicinity who have no choice but to endure the unbearable stench and risk infection, complained about the frequency with which waste is being dumped and the scant regard for the health hazards posed to the public. Taking this complaint into consideration, it seems, they moved operations 20 feet away, right behind the construction site of the new Marriott Hotel. So is that a room with a view or a room with a stench? Because we don't know about you, but if we woke up in a luxury hotel overlooking a dirty beach and could visibly see sewage trucks dumping the contents of the city's toilets into the ocean every day, what's the point of a picture like this? Advertising a beach. The report is further incorrect in its assertion that no recreational activities take place within the vicinity of the outfall pipe and as we have seen, the open dumping by Sivon's Waste and Puran Brothers. Fishing is a recreational activity and for some, it's a livelihood. Head out to the jetty in front of the Marriott construction site any day of the year and you'll find people engaged in recreational fishing. Absolutely none of the persons we spoke to on the jetty at any time were aware of the fact raw sewage was being dumped into the water just meters from where they were catching their food. We remind you at this stage, Guyana still doesn't have a wastewater treatment plant and very little testing is done to determine how much fecal matter is in our waterways, much less our estuaries. We don't have a water quality testing kit but we do have noses. And judging from the nausea inducing stench emanating from the Kingston and Lamaha Street canals, sometimes we think there's a serious problem. The city of Georgetown sits atop three aquifers, which are named from upper to lower, the upper sands, the A sand, and the B sand. Overlaying layers of clay confine the two lower aquifers, protecting them from contamination from external sources. The inspection on some manholes located close to the pumping stations gave evidence of the critical status of the whole street sewers network. After noting the widespread infiltration of sewage into our environment and that after decades without any intervention or repairs, 
corrosion may have reached devastating levels. Hydea highlights the fact that the continuous surcharging of sewer networks and consequent infiltration of crude sewage due to online drains can engender the contamination of groundwater and soils, as well as inflow to possible water mains, drinking water. The observations resulting from the inspections and computations indicate that a considerable volume of wastewater infiltrates into the ground through openings spread across the sewer networks. The safety of pedestrians and workers, access difficulties, disturbance of traffic and public utilities, air quality and noise problems, environmental risks due to water pumping and discharge, and materials management were all highlighted in the report as ways the project may impact residents. As regards construction, it was noted that activities would necessitate temporary on-site storage of construction materials and excavated materials, and that bad management of the stored materials and wastes could result in their dispersion in the nearby canals, streets, and adjacent properties. This is what they mean by bad management. It is noted that the deep trenches, the open trenches and manholes, and the vehicles and machines operating on site can create health and safety risks for both workers and pedestrians in case of unstable excavation sections, inadequate shoring, fencing, and signage. This is what they mean by safety risk. Inadequate shoring, fencing, and signage all in one. The key positive environmental impacts expected from this project are reduction of leakage into the ground and superficial groundwater, reduction of contamination of potable water consequent to infiltration of wastewater, elimination of leakage into canals, consequent improvement of the public health and sanitary conditions of central Georgetown residents. It was noted that during the operation phase, the collected sewage will be discharged into the Demerara River estuary without any preliminary treatment. But this is already the current situation. With the new system in place, specific recommendations were also made for the time period during which sewage should be disposed, four hours a day during the low tide periods, so as to capitalize on the higher velocity of the water 40 meters out from shore. There is absolutely no mention of the Marriott Hotel at any point in any of the documents available for perusal, and we doubt it'll be in the tourist brochures, but think about it. In addition, no one really knows just how dangerous the water is, not even the consultants. Remember, they sent samples to the lab of the Guyana Sugar Corporation and a private lab in Georgetown, and both came back with the same suspicious results. Both tests seemed to suggest there was no presence of fecal coliform, or in other words, bacteria from your poo, in any of the wastewater tested. They asserted either the test for the laboratory wasn't 100% sure or the labs themselves weren't reliable. In real terms, detecting no fecal coliforms is next to impossible because you only have to walk around and smell the air in some parts of the city to know that raw sewage is leaking into the environment. It is impossible to find no fecal matter in the estuary waters because nobody is following procedure anymore and with the amount of sewage being sprayed onto the rocks every day, six and sometimes seven days a week, it's a virtual guarantee the presence of E. coli and fecal coliforms is high. Furthermore, if you ever have the pleasure of seeing this on your early morning walk, well, you know it's impossible. Georgetown especially has a very serious problem where human waste is concerned. Where do you think, for a start, all these people go to do their business? We could only identify two functioning public washrooms in a city of over 250,000 people. Now this in itself has serious implications where it concerns many of the people handling our food and money on a daily basis. Where do all the minibus and taxi drivers pee? We all know that on the side of the road. And where do they wash their hands? Well, nowhere. Now think about that the next time you count in your money. Some members of the public use the toilet facilities in fast food restaurants and stores that provide the facility, but they don't exactly let everyone in. Which means, on a daily basis, there are at least a hundred homeless people openly or otherwise defecating into our canals, gutters, bushes, on the beach, you name it, 
we have footage to prove the point. But we hope this is enough for you to understand where we're coming from. In the afternoons, people catch fish in those same canals, uninformed of the presence of fecal matter in the water. Then you have the hundreds of stray animals wandering about and the horse carts adding to the piles of excrement piling up in the city. Inland, well, you have all those damaged sewer mains crossing the trenches and canals, seeping sewage into the online drains and posing a threat to our groundwater supply. If your eyebrows aren't hitting the roof yet, then consider what happens when it rains. And the poor drainage and irrigation due to years of neglect brings all that dirty water onto the streets, where it mixes with the toxic leachate from the numerous garbage piles building up steadily around the city. Why aren't alarm bells going off all over? Well, Real Guyana believes it's due to a governmental predisposition to pushing the good and stifling the bad. We Guyanese don't like to look bad or have anyone say something negative about our country. But guess what? It already looks bad. Real bad. Or as we say in GT, it look in dread. Unless we actively seek on a national level to develop a culture of excellence where shoddy work, poor service and facility are not in any way tolerated, then there's more of this to come and it will come to affect us all, one way or another. One nurse at the Georgetown Public Hospital revealed last month that a man from the West Coast had died of leptospirosis. A gynecologist we spoke to indicated there's a common bacterial infection many women initially think to be a yeast infection, and that said bacteria is in the water coming through our taps. It's sad to note, however, that even at this stage, Guyana not only has no wastewater management plan, but doesn't even have a comprehensive set of data on the quality of our water. It was recommended to enhance the capacities of GWI laboratories or the Guyana University Laboratories for executing this kind of analysis, allowing for the commencement of a comprehensive water analysis program to be implemented by GWI, EPA or other governmental bodies. And we agree, but only time will tell. Here's some real opinion. Not every project announced with bells and whistles, wrapped in a cloak of goodwill and brandished in your face as a sign of progress, is what it seems. Given that this is a good move, it's come at a very late stage in the game, about four or five decades late. We're in a position now where we have to carry out these works. It never misses the attention of anyone keen on traveling that Guyana is a country without zoning or building regulations. Zoning is meant to enforce guidelines on where you can and cannot locate a business. And building regulations exist to make sure new construction takes account of infrastructure, weight and height of said building, etc. In some countries, you get sent to jail for erecting a four-story business in a residential neighborhood or using your street as a parking lot for your bush trucks. But this is Guyana, and just about anything goes. How is this relative to sewage improvement? Well, where's all the wastewater from these buildings supposed to go? As it is, every few weeks there's a nauseating smell coming from parts of the city, which can only be sewage mixed with the water in our capital city's drains. Bear in mind, this is supposed to be the example set to the rest of Guyana. On paper, we applaud the sewage improvement works but we also think it falls terribly short of what is actually needed to sanitize the city. We need to start looking at the problems in terms of their multi-dimensional nature, case in point being the sewage problem. To really start the restoration of the Garden City, a number of problems need to be tackled with a coordinated approach. Now we're not civil engineers, but here's what's been observed in the last eight months or so since the decision was made to start honestly documenting the decline of Guyana. The three problems Real Guyana believes should be tackled in sync are garbage, drainage and irrigation, and public sanitation. All three impact each other and the sewage problem in the city. Here's why. First of all, garbage has become a major problem across Guyana. Over the past two years, the problem has become overbearing. Garbage brings with it a host of problems. It's a breeding ground for rats and vermin, which then find their way into your homes when it rains and the streets in your neighborhood flood. It poses, in some cases, a serious health hazard by way of its contents, 
openly disposed of on the streets, riverbanks, and in the drains. Again, you name it, we've seen it or smelled it on a Guyanese roadside. Burning diapers full of poo, plastic, condoms, and insect repellent containers which explode in the flames. We've seen ladies' sanitary products disposed of in household garbage that ends up in the streets, in bags opened by stray dogs and junkies looking for food. This is not about being disgusting for the sake of it, it's about being honest. It is disgusting. And the sooner we admit there's a problem, the sooner we can start to address it. What good is it proclaiming your worth as a proud Guyanese? If you're sitting on your hands, watching your beloved country turn into a cesspit, what's there to be proud of then? Chana and Eggball? Get real. Guyana is much more than Kaitro Falls. Virgin Forest and Pepper Pot. It's also partly embodied by the plight of its people. Our maintenance of the spaces which aren't so virgin anymore speaks volumes of our respect for the land we call our home. We live in a shanty town, perched on a mountain of gold only few have access to. If that doesn't boggle your mind, well, we need some of what you're taking. So, garbage is number one. Problem number two is the drainage and irrigation. We'll put out a more extensive video on the topic in the future, but for now it shall suffice to say, almost 90% of the drainage and irrigation work in the capital for the year alone has been carried out in the last month or so, after the spring tides produced record waves and overtopping caused the flooding of large sections of this upper income neighborhood. The drains were so heavily silted up because no one bothered to clear them during the dry season, and some had so much silt and grass they were almost indistinguishable from the parpet. A hasty clearing effort took place around the site, which in combination with the outlet pumps helped alleviate the flooding, but residents still sustained millions in losses due to water damage. Oh, and the British and Canadian diplomatic ambassadors live around here. So how's that for a warm Guyanese welcome? The only other time for the year that there has been limited cleaning of drains was in the lead up to World Environment Day. This is how they left it and how it will most likely stay if the past is anything to go by. Thing is, the situation with the drains and canals around the city has deteriorated to such an extent a couple of days cleaning the streets the diplomats used to get to work and people used to come from the airport that didn't do much, and it was even sadder to see that as World Environment Day came to an end, so did the cleaning, with Starbrook News announcing the end of a month-long cleanup campaign. But right now, most of the drains in the city are clogged, and the city is full of garbage. We all know that. During the rainy season, the water has nowhere to go, and ends up flooding large parts of Georgetown. But on the coastland especially, our network of drains, gutters and canals was built as a means of absorbing excess water so the city wouldn't flood when the tide was high and the water couldn't be released into the ocean. Like our sewage system, things have been allowed to reach a critical stage and we fear only a disease outbreak will bring any action. But it doesn't have to reach that stage. In fact, it shouldn't. Problem number three. Public sanitation. As mentioned earlier, this is a massive problem. Not only should it be unacceptable to have two or three public toilets in a city of close to 250,000 people, the condition of those toilets in existence should be deemed unacceptable and unfit for use. They do not currently promote hygienic practice, as they are filthy themselves. So where do you think the vendors you buy your food from in the market go to the toilet? Would you use this toilet? I don't need to urinate or defecate. I'm just walking through. This is the ladies' toilet. Wash your hands. That's another lady's toilet. Let's check out the men's. A 
again. What about your taxi driver and minibus conductor? Where are they washing their hands? Where are they emptying their bladders? It also needs to become unacceptable for people to be urinating on the side of the road and defecating in the bushes and drains. All those slots there are basically outlets from the toilets and it flows over the sewage, flows over the rocks and onto the drains. At the end there, that's about three piles of human excrement, right? And that gets washed down all into this drain. And this drain directly leads to North Road through this culvert here. All right. So that water directly connects with this water here. Right, this is the culvert it comes through and up and down the road all right the water is actually green so you know there's feces in this water and every day there are people fishing in here because they don't know any better but they deserve to know to avoid coming into contact with this water when it rains and the city floods it's virtually impossible for some people at times you either have to walk through it get your feet muddy in the corner or risk death avoiding the puddle by walking in the middle of the road. In addition, the dumping of garbage is even noted by Hydea as a major cause of the inefficiency of the sewage system. Everything is interlinked in some way and to ignore one problem is to allow another to grow. Ever since the man has come in and does run some fine cane, um, cane yes, over the thing, does thing and next thing the water to drop again and by then the real fall again the water. So how long has it been since they cleaned any of these drains in this area? Years. The man just come and years. It's years the man come, come and clean. Years. years they didn't come and clean. Yeah. Yeah. They used to dig it in the Orleans. In the Orleans, I know it's youth. Man living here. Some guys for 18 years I don't live in here. They used to dig, come and dig this drain. Now, the culvert break in there, the road break in. So obviously blocking up the culvert. So every like 20 minutes rain you get here. So this year you just get this here. Cause it's you have these structures like pretty much permanent cause it looks yeah. like the flooding is yeah, serious. Yeah. You see down here. Yeah. Every just 20 it's minutes rain. Man patch it's 20 minutes rain and this happens? Yeah, just it's before that. Nothing like you want to patch there. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes rain. There's keep breaking the steady car, the culvert breaking. And the culvert patch it yesterday. Down here? No, right by the roads, by the post. The road, patch the road. <laughs> all the water going back in there. Come to the water cut off. I remember saw one time all the water cut off it in the night, right? The water going back in there. Which water? The, the, um, the waste water there. Mm -hmm. We'll be going back in the pipe. Obviously, you have the water cut off from the pipe. And you, the pipe get a little hole, all the houses. It look like obviously they get a little hole there, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously the water don't seep back in there. The nasty water don't seep back. I used to walk where the walks. Yeah. And something we got to do about men in the church and them kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. They might tell you now, left the water, let it run out for five minutes and them kind of thing. Well, but because really you know it's nasty water. Positive. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, these sewage works they're doing around the city. Yeah. That's one thing to highlight it, that it's possible contamination to drinking water Positive supply. Yeah, yes. You know, because of holes around the network. Shit, everything you walk in, they tell you all in there, all there, right? there, whatever you think, you know, collide it together, you walk in there. Just fathers get you know, they tell you, get you strong, and they tell you, you think about it. As a result of that blocked culvert, you've got problems like this popping up. Alright, so you've got the raw sewage. This is someone's bridge that they definitely have to jump over. I hope it's not an old person that's arthritic. You know, you gotta think about everyone. What if a disabled person lives there? Anyone for that matter could get sick. And then on this side of the road, you got some of the compound problems due to the water. You've got erosion of the side of the road, and it's literally started to sink. Morning. Yeah. 
if we fast couple of weeks. Every in the past month. couple of weeks, the street there like this. The place there, between over there, that's uh -huh. a thing like a trench. They need. Then they not know, it exactly need to be back right? like a, a full a, a yes, trench, not a drain. Yes, a little girl, I know this road because that thing like a trench and dig, you know, the water could roll in there. Exactly. So they don't come and clear this no? area. No, I didn't come and do nothing. Nobody come and do nothing. Much the same this around George. Well, rainfall one day, this street flood and take like six seven days before it go down. Come and this thing higher, 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 higher. In there, just bring a front end loader and dig out this whole thing here in the water because they will put empty out in there. So weeks they can't get water for come out from in there. This will happen to you. Let's protect a piece of place. This part. Yeah, this part is protected from out there. Come back this side later. They're not doing anything, and then people come in and dump a whole set of stuff. Bring in trucks coming with stuff and just dumping it over there. Garbage it, and land. Exactly, so the hell builds up the, this this um, flooding as it is. And they throw a set of sand, and and that was all of it. The sand, and then it, it just leaves just like like a well, a white elephant. It just leaves just like that, and that was it. Nothing more. Nothing more. Nothing more. They just dig apart, break down apart, throw a whole set of white sand, and that was it. Nothing more, nothing, nothing, nothing more. They come and do it. It stays just inside, develop all the bushes, and nobody cares. Nobody don't care.